Our, our next presenter is Maria Olnick, Assistant Director of the Foreign Educated Physician to Nursing Program, and she's going to be presenting on the World Cafe. Good morning, I'm Maria Lenick. I'm from the Biscayne Bay campus at FIU. I'm the assistant director of the Foreign Educated Physician Program. Um, it's an accelerated program where they do their bachelors and masters and become nurse practitioners. Um, so my students come from over 30 countries um, around the world. Uh, the World Cafe is a concept that I found when I was in, at a conference in Vancouver, British Columbia um, on interprofessional education and collaborating across borders. I thought it was really interesting because it sort of resonated with my own um, teaching philosophy and the, and the way that I run you know, my life and my work in terms of I like to make a comfortable space and I like to be approachable and I don't like to, I, I like the, the um, uh, you know, uh, build presence, not pressure. I feel like my job is to help students accomplish their goals and objectives by the end of my course, um, and I facilitate that in ways that are not um, necessarily, you know, um, um, you know, my students can be intimidated for a number of reasons. You know, first that they come to this country and English is their second language, um, and they have to do a lot of writing in my classes. Um, so I, I like to make it a comfortable space. And so this was designed by Juanita Brown, David Isaacs, and the World Cafe community, and you can find it at theworldcafe.com, uh, and it's where talk um, leads to action. The hospitable space um, is supposed to be likened to, you know, a cafe, um, a golf course, places where people feel comfortable talking. If I were to do a World Cafe, um, example in this class, you know, I may have added some flowers to the tables, I may have, you know, put some newspapers around, you know, there's coffee, there's bagels, there's, you know, we come in here and nobody's under pressure, we're just going to talk about the content at hand or the discussion at hand. So genuine conversation leads to creative endeavors. So it's all about the conversation, but as you're having the conversation and as you're directing the conversation in a course or, you know, whether it's in person or it's online, um, first of all, you're, you're uh, creating the, the content um, and ideas that you want to talk about. So I do have discussion questions. I do have um, you know, objectives and goals for my class, obviously, but I'm looking for collective insights. So in my nursing uh, global online course that I teach, you know, I, when I first taught it, we used just the textbook. And so a lot of the answers I was getting back in class and a lot of the discussion were just about the chapters that they were asked to read, and it was not very eclectic. It was not very interesting for me to read as a faculty. So as I started to teach this course, you know, in, in subsequent semesters, I ask them, you know, don't rely on just the textbook. You know, we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about healthcare reform, we're talking about nursing, we're talking about global healthcare, we're talking about um, your perspectives because you're from over 30 different countries. Where have you practiced? What have you done? What are the kinds of patients that you've seen? What are the healthcare disparities? Um, and so tell me about that. You know, I'm from Pennsylvania. I don't have near the global perspectives that my students have, although I do know nursing models and I do know mor morbidity, mortality, things like that, but I don't want them to feel uncomfortable talking about their experiences or bringing to light the global perspectives that they, that they have. Um, so collective insights, I want them to get the New York Times, I want them to watch the news, I want them to talk to their classmates, and then make it a comfortable discussion as if they're sitting at a table with, with flowers and newspapers and food. Um, and then you harvest the discoveries. So you talk about, you know, well, what is it, what are the themes that come forward? Um, what is it that we've learned through this discussion? Where, where do we agree? Where do we disagree? Um, what can we do going forward to improve healthcare, to improve nursing? What kinds of ideas um, can we take forward? And then we uh, have action planning. So, you know, if we're talking about, you know, healthcare reform, um, what do you do about your perspectives? What do you do about the things that you'd like to bring forward to make patient outcomes better? Do you write letters? Do you write articles? Um, do you do presentations? Do you talk, continue to talk amongst your peers and bring your ideas forward? Um, implementation, 
and then feedback and assessment and reflection and exploration. So these are all a sort of a debriefing process in terms of what kinds of ideas have come forward, which ones um, imply action and implementation. Um, we reflect on, on what people have said and um, what, again, what we agree with, what we disagree with. But again, it all focuses around the conversation. It all focuses around the comfortable space. Um, it all focuses on, on the content idea. So if someone is, is going off topic, you know, you, you bring them back with, you know, asking them a question or asking them to elaborate on what they've said. The principles for hosting the conversations that matter are um, set the context and create the hospitable space. So, you know, identify what your objectives and goals are, identify what your content of the day is, and then create the comfortable space. So, even if I'm teaching an online course, I usually will meet with the class in person the first day so that I can see their faces, so that we can, I learned as a nurse, I learned so much about people just by talking with them in person and seeing their, their faces, the way that they look, the way that they, you know, whether they're leaning forward or they're kind of, you know, laid back. Um, so that's important to me. Explore the questions that matter. This is where my discussion questions, um, um, where I post my discussion questions and people engage in those. I do uh, require that they participate and I do make it uh, worth points, um, many points for them. Uh, encourage contributions and connect diverse perspectives. So, um, a lot of what we just discussed in the last, uh, you know, in nursing we call it therapeutic communication. So, you know, we use things like, I hear what you're saying, tell me more. Um, you know, um, um, I, I agree with part of what you've said, but, you know, here's where I disagree. So, so in nursing we call that com therapeutic communication, but it's very much like what he, the gentleman was describing previously. Uh, listen for insights. So if we hear great ideas or great insights, you know, I want to bring that forward. I want to elaborate on those. And then to share the collective discoveries. So usually at the end of the course, it's, it's a presentation, it's a group paper, um, something that the students are putting together to describe what they've, what they've learned throughout the course. You know, for my research class that I'm teaching now, it's, you know, I have them putting together a proposal, but the discussions, again, research can be very intimidating, and I don't want that to happen with my students. So we, we have uh, group discussions in class. I go to each group. I work with each group. I tell them, you know, bring something for lunch. Bring some coffee, you know, and, and so students are sitting together. They're working in groups. They're not, um, they know that they can ask me questions about the research without feeling that, you know, that I've got more knowledge of nursing research than them right now um, and that they don't want to ask a silly question. You know, they, they're very comfortable with approaching me, coming to my office, saying, can our group meet with you? Um, now, sometimes as a professor, you know, because I'm so open to that, it causes a lot of students to constantly <laughs> come to my office. So I do need to say, you know, Please do it between these certain hours. You know, please make an appointment with me. And so the whole purpose is to evoke collective intelligence. As I had mentioned, particularly in the, in the nursing global courses that I teach, um, they bring an entire global perspective. Many of my students, um, you know, I have a student who practiced 27 years in Nicaragua. I have a student from Costa Rica who continues to work on the cruise ships because the international ND license is still uh, valid. So he travels all over the world, I mean, much more than I ever have or, or could even at this point. Um, you know, I have the uh, American nursing model and, and nursing models in general, morbidity, mortality, things like that. So, so collective intelligence, bringing together their global perspectives and the nursing perspectives that I have to teach them and putting it all together and creating actionable results. So where do we find in these conversations um, that we can change something or make something better? And then if that's the case, how do we go about it? What are the different steps in, in perhaps changing legislature or doing whatever needs be to improve patient outcomes? And then, thank you, and we'll open for questions. Um, the idea is, again, there's the picture of the cafe. Cafe is, you know, if you can just imagine, 
you know, sitting at an outdoor cafe, having a conversation where there's no, they had, they had mentioned this at the beginning of the, of the conference, where there's no, you know, faculty, student, um, you know, uh, uh, staff, administration type of hierarchy, but it's just a conversation. So the, the ways that I grade them are based on, um, you know, not necessarily, uh, you know, as long as they're answering the question, um, if I, ha if I, I tell them, you know, if, if, if you're not answering the question, I'll put a comment in there. And if my comment is elaborate on this particular piece, um, then, then, you know, I'll, I'll still give you the points, but you do need to elaborate on what I've asked you, you know, because I, I won't take, um, you know, I, discussions that are not targeted at completing their objectives and goals. Yes? Okay, so my students are very unique. My students are foreign educated physicians, which means that they are MDs in other countries around the world. Okay, so I have doctors from Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Venezuela, Colombia, um, China, Czech Republic, Ukraine. Um, what happens is that they come here to the United States, and the United States has a system where they only allow so many, if the, you know, if this many physicians come, only this many get residencies. There's a very strict limit on how many foreign educated doctors can come to this country and gain medical licensure. They all come through an entity called Education Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, which is in Pennsylvania. They all take the USMLE, which is the United States Medical Licensure Exam Test. Many of them pass. Some of them that don't pass, it's probably due to their language capabilities. It may or may not be due to, you know, I have a, a student from Syria who couldn't get his transcripts. I have, a, you know, students from Cuba sometimes have difficulty getting their transcripts. So it's not that there's any difference in real capability. It's just that for one reason or another, they can't practice here in the United States. Once about five years have passed, um, then it becomes a very grim situation in, in, in terms of if they haven't obtained a United States medical residency and a license at that point, then probably they need to look for an alternative. And my program is one, the only alternative that accelerates them into being nurse practitioners in this country. So these are doctors from all over the world that come here together, encounter a similar difficulty in gaining medical licensure, come to our program in Miami, and then we, they're actually in a program that transitions them into nursing. So when I talk about collective intelligence, it's regarding the content that we're covering in a particular course, um, a particular objective within a course. Um, so we talk about perspectives on that content and putting it together. And so in a global health course, it, it talks about, you know, nursing around the world, um, healthcare reform, socialized medicine. I mean, those are just some of the things that we talk about in that, in that particular course. Um, yeah. So I was particularly intrigued by your uh, end result of the actionable uh, result, I think you called it. So mm -hmm. in every class, you, uh, for the end, they have to do something that leads to action. Not in every class. It depends on the content. Um, it, you know, if it is with regard to health reform, then perhaps there is an actionable result. Um, if it is, um, you know, in terms of, of research and the things that they want to get involved in or the things that they want to do, we certainly facilitate their movement forward in whatever their goals are. So, yes. But we do encourage, a lot of our students have, have published and done some great things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was wondering, you know, like US has one of the world's best healthcare system. Uh -huh. We are bringing people in many of their com our world countries where the healthcare system is not so good. Right. So, and in any program, we have a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, instead of teaching them the US way of doing things, mm -hmm. why waste time in pulling out you know, their knowledge of how they are doing things in a failed healthcare system? What well, they, because, you know, some of these people that come from, from countries, for example, um, they don't maybe have a lot of technology. 
So they rely on their physical assessment skills. So some of the students that I have can pick up a gall, uh, you know, an inflamed gallbladder or you know a cardiac without you know your expensive CAT scan, your expensive MRI, your expensive blood work. So, so where some you know where we rely on a lot of diagnostic tests, they rely on their intuition and their training and their expertise in physical assessment. So we have different strengths and weaknesses. What we do is we take where they're really strong, pathophysiology, you know, um, and bring it together. And of course, they have to uh, acclimate to the American health this is, because this is where they're going to practice ultimately. Um, but certainly, they come with many strengths, even if they come from a failed healthcare system. Another strength is that they're very family and community oriented, and that's wonderful um, to see. So, so they, do, they do, even if the healthcare systems are not strong, it doesn't necessarily mean that the practitioners are not, or that they can't be trained to be very strong practitioners. Thank you. Thank you.